<laughs> we'd meet friends on the street and they'd say, how's Frida? They wouldn't say, how are you? They wouldn't say, how's Helen or how's Ruth? They'd say, how's Frida? It used to make us kind of mad. <laughs> My name is Lois Broad. My name was Lois Johnson before I was married. I'm going to tell you the story of one of my sisters who was really very unusual. You would love her if you met her. Everybody did. But she was very different. I was the fifth of five children. We lived on Evelyn Avenue and my mother kept chickens in a little hen house. And my sister Frida used to walk around with the chickens on lead like pets. And of course, after the chickens got old, my mother cooked them and served them for dinner. But Frida would not eat them because they had been her pets. When my brother said to her, what about the meat you eat? That's animals killed. She quit eating meat that day. Frida was not a great student at Humberside because she was an artist. She was an artist from when she was born. All her textbooks, the borders of all her textbooks at high school were filled with drawings. So she barely got through high school. My sister Frida wanted to be a portrait painter, so I was her first subject. This was the first portrait she did in watercolor. And of course, then she realized that watercolor was not a good medium for portraits because you can't change a watercolor. But this is actually quite a good picture of me when I was 15. This is a picture of my father that my sister paint, uh, did in charcoal. It's exactly as I remember him. My father was 58 when I was born. So how I remember him as a retired man sitting in a big upholstered chair reading. She finally got out of high school and went to the Ontario College of Art, where her teachers were a group of seven people. Lauren Harris, Frank Johnson, Lismer, Franklin Carmichael. She graduated with a gold medal and their sponsor was Franklin Carmichael. My sister Frida would go out into the country and do sketches and on, on Masonite, and then if they liked it, would come back into, into the house and do a big, larger painting on a canvas. Her first job out of college was with Eaton's. Eaton's and Simpson's were the two big department stores, and they each had about two full page ads in the Toronto papers. So Frida was one of the artists working on that and became their head artist because she was so good. At that time, there was a strike for artists all over the city and she met a fellow. They met on the picket line and started a romance. He had been an illustrator and an author of children's books. Do you know the little golden books? That was Joe's. Did a lot of those. He was very successful. She was married in 1938. Uh, I was 11. And <laughs> my, my mother went down to Eaton's to bring a, a dress home for me to be the, the little flower girl. And it was a small cotton dress. And there was no way I was going to wear that for when I was 11. So I made her. I made her take it back, and I ended up with a very nice pink taffeta long dress. And then Joe said to Frida, I would like to go to the States for a year and try my luck. If I make it, you can come down and we'll work down there. If I don't make it, I'll come back after a year. She was left to raise the two children. He did not support her in any way. So they were living in a rented house on Glen Lake near Dundas. The first floor she rented out to her friend, and then Frida uh, made the second floor. There was a kitchen and a living room and her studio. And then the third floor was two bedrooms where the two kids and she slept. To make her living, she had to work there all day, every day, on the second floor, 
and look after the kids. Now, uh, Joe went down to the States a year before Frida, and when Frida went down, they had, he had saved enough money to buy a house at 18 Edgewood Avenue in Springdale, Connecticut, which was a suburb of Stanford, Connecticut. And she had a studio in their dining room, and uh, Joe had built a studio for himself on his property. So he went in once a week to New York to his agent, and one, about 14 or 15 years after they moved down there, uh, he went in one weekend, uh, one week to his agent, and she told him she was going to retire. And he was so afraid of poverty because he'd been raised poor in Sudbury uh, that it was such a shock that he had a heart attack and died two days later at the age of 52 and left free with three children to raise. Joe had a friend named Ed DeLavey. And Ed DeLavey was also an artist, and he made his living by not selling his paintings, but by going to a friend's house and fixing their house up, doing their laundry, doing their cooking, doing their carpentry for about six weeks at a time. Now, when Joe died, it just happened that Ed DeLavey was living at Frida's place for the six weeks. And Frida, on the rebound, fell madly in love with Ed DeLavey. Frida, he says, I can't stay here. The, the neighbors will talk. So he says, I'll go to New Mexico for two years, and then I'll come back and we'll marry. During the first year, she couldn't live without him. Oh, she couldn't live without him. So she wrote him, Ed, Ed, come back, come back. <laughs> so Ed comes back, and they married. In the meantime, Frida attended church. She was quite religious, really. And um, the church announced that there was a young man in South America, a kid, that needed his teeth fixed. So Frida paid for this guy to come up and live with her. Now, he was 18, the same age as her son at that time. <laughs> and she fell in love with him. He lived with her from the time he was 18 till he was 40. And they were having an affair. I mean, everybody knew it. Anyway, Ed got fed up and he left. That was the end of Ed. <laughs> One day she was at a bus stop and there was another young man standing there. And of course, Frida starts to talk to him. And it turns out that this young man told her that he had a girlfriend who was on welfare who had two children and they didn't have any place to live. So Frida says, okay, you can live in my basement. But over the years, they kept kind of creeping out of their own basement into her house. And one by one, they took over the rooms until eventually Frida was in the bedroom and the kitchen, that's all she had of her house. And then, not only did that happen, <laughs> but she wanted to give him the house when she died. <laughs> and her family said, no, 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 but they gave it the house cheap to him. He is still there, and they now run a daycare center in Frida's house. Can you imagine that? She was so naive that she thought that if she kept her prices low, she would have work. So someone would say, oh, I love your portraits. I'd love you to do it of my children. And I don't have any money, but I have a really good used TV. When I was down there with my 15-year-old son, there were three dead TVs in the living room. So finally, when she was in about her 70s, she decided she was working too hard because she was working seven days a week to make ends meet because she wasn't charging up. So she put her prices up. Guess what? She got three times the amount of commissions. Frida was a little bit different in that she would give you anything and she would give anybody anything, but she neglected her own family. And of course, everybody loved Frida because she was so animated and interesting and good looking. But interestingly enough, when she was about 87, she quit painting. Cold turkey. For whatever reason, that's the way it was. And then she died at 93, still slim and beautiful, but very unusual.